Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Evidence Sabbath Sunday. I know this looks a little different, but we want to make sure that we're all energized and ready to go for a new year in 2021. I know we're super excited for what God's about to do, and we hope that you guys are, are ready to get on board as well. But to start this morning, I want to to paint a picture of one of the more embarrassing Christmas memories that I have. The year is 1997. I'm in fourth grade, about 10 years old, and I'm rocking a Jonathan Taylor Thomas hairdo right down the middle. It was, it was spectacular. And it was our church's Christmas potluck. And my dad wanted to do a, a special father-son duet. Now, it's nothing too uncommon that was something we did a lot growing up. We did a lot of trumpet duets and the sort. But this year, he wanted to do the little drummer boy with him on the accordion and me on a little tinny drum. And to top it off, we had just received some Christmas gifts from a missionary family. And my gift was a little tiny Filipino vest. Now, I've always been a little bit broader shoulder, so this, this tiny vest made me like crunch me together like this. And so here I am playing on this tinny drum, mind you, the drum covered with Muppets all around the sides because it's just a toy drum. Fourth grade, embarrassed, just this rot, ta, 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 rot, ta, 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 ta. To this day, I hate, I loathe the little drummer boy. And to even prove my point a little more, I found this uh, a couple weeks ago, and I thought this was, was pretty funny. Mary, exhausted having just gotten Jesus to sleep, is approached by a young man who thinks to himself, what this girl needs is a drum solo. So I will never not think of that moment when I hear that song. So that's why I, I never, ever listen to it at Christmas. But we made it. Christmas has come and gone, and I don't know about you, but Christmas, especially this year, I was super looking forward to. Uh, the traditions, the time with family, uh, the food, all of it, I was super excited about. But the question I wanna ask uh, this morning, or whenever you're watching this, is now that Christmas is done, now what? And, and I'm not just talking like emotionally, but, but spiritually as well and, and not even just christmas when when normally we we run into these spiritual highs that those don't last forever so after a spiritual high what are we supposed to do because if your experience is anything like mine uh, those, those spiritual highs don't last forever and often come before a, a, a spiritual low a, a low moment in my life and to help us kind of answer that question today, we're going to be in the book of Matthew, specifically chapter 2, immediately following the Christmas story. I want to just look at three verses. Uh, the first three verses that follow after the, the wise men have left uh, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And the book of Matthew has, has, a, has a unique look, a unique account of Jesus' story. Because it's one of only two books in the Bible that say really anything about Jesus' birth and childhood. And... So today I want to look at three verses, ask two questions, and have you walk away with uh, an application. So it's kind of, kind of three Bible verses, two simple questions, and an application that you get to take home. Huh? No, I'm sorry. That was, let's focus. Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child, to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I will call my son. So to start, I want to start with the question, why Egypt? 
And there's three reasons I want to look at. There's probably more than three reasons uh, why, but the three I want to look at this morning is one, and the first, it's right in front of you in verse 15, uh, to fulfill the prophecy of the prophet Hosea in Hosea 2, I think verse 15, where it says those words, out of Egypt I will come, call my son, uh, because there's over 400 prophecies that all point to Jesus and the true son of God needed to fulfill all 400 plus of those. And so this was one step to take so that prophecy was fulfilled. The second is that Egypt would have taken them about 90 miles outside of Bethlehem, outside of Herod's jurisdiction in a different country where they would have been a refugee, um, but still outside of any place that Herod could have reached to them. And third, I can't help but think of the resemblance of Jesus's story here, being sent to Egypt and then being called out of Egypt, the same as the Israelites were sent to Egypt, stuck in Egypt, but then called out of Egypt. And I think that's important and something I want you to write down and help remember is that God, when he pleases, can make the worst of places serve the best of purposes. As followers of Christ, we can't see our circumstances as barriers for what God wants to do, or our situations as, as a gap of something that God can't get through or, or do something in and through. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, we read, But he said to me, and that's Jesus speaking to Paul here, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. It's easy to get lazy and singular focused when we're in a, a bad season, when we're in a low valley point in our spiritual walk. We're, we're focused on the question, God, can you get me out of here? Can you get me out of here? Can you get me out of here? But I think we miss so much of what God wants to do when our focus is to only be taken out of a circumstance instead of asking how can we be used in a circumstance. Could you imagine what might happen, what could happen if, if Christ's body, the church, the capital C church decided to stop asking, God, can you get me out of 2020? But God, can you use me in 2020? I think we would see some amazing revival if we would seriously stop trying to be taken out of our circumstances and start to be used in them. Again, because God can make the worst of places serve the best of purposes and not just places, but situations, seasons. God can take the worst of seasons and make them serve the best of purposes if you're willing to allow him to do that. The second question I wanna focus on in these short three verses is where are the miracles? Why aren't there any miracles here? I mean, cause we're coming, uh, we're following the coattails of an amazing birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, whole bunch of angels in the sky singing a, a star placed in the sky to point to the Savior. All of these things happening, a virgin birth. I mean, all of these miracles happening to just show and to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And then the first real threat to Jesus in the land, in his home, where he's supposed to be glorified and uh, celebrated. There's no miraculous exit. There's no uh, magic flying carpet. There's a dream. And there, there's uh, a command. And then what we see is obedience. Which leads me to my second point of don't neglect the ordinary in your journey towards the supernatural. I've heard too many times that uh, 
when I get to this point in my life, then I'll get serious about my relationship with God. Or when God does this for me, then I'll get serious about my relationship with God. Or just fill in the blank, then I'll whatever. But God's desire is not just for us to, to worship him in the highs and, and cry out to him in our lows, but to spend every moment worshiping and, and in communion with him. And that means going through the ordinary, everyday steps of following Christ. Not just when things are great or when things are terrible, but everything in between. Which I know deals a lot more with something that's called spiritual disciplines. And I'd love to have time to go into that more. But if you'd love to learn more about what spiritual disciplines are, uh, I would highly suggest a book, Celebration of Discipline by, by Richard Foster. It's a great breakdown of each of uh, the main spiritual disciplines and some simple, easy ways that you can be practicing them in your life. And to be honest, they're, they're things that I'm still learning and growing and being challenged by in practicing those disciplines. Because yes, there, there's freedom in Christ, but that freedom doesn't come without some form, without some, some set of, of boundaries, because freedom without form is just chaos. And so we need to be focused on the ordinary, on the everyday, on those disciplines, as we're trying to grow in our relationship with Christ. So to close, uh, to keep this nice and short, uh, as we're leaving Christmas, and not just Christmas, as, as we find ourselves leaving spiritual high moments moving forward, we need to remember that one, God can make the worst of places, the worst of circumstances serve the best of purposes. And two, remember that we can't neglect the ordinary in our journey towards the supernatural. As as followers of Christ, if we truly believe that, that God's power can be made great in our weaknesses, and we are faithful to be obedient to his calling and his leading in the day-to-day, -day, in the ordinary things, I believe that there can be a revival in, in our circles of influence, in our cities, in our communities. And I hope and I pray that you are willing to take those steps uh, and, and lean and trust God in that. Thanks again for being here. Thanks again for watching. I, I hope and, and pray that this was impactful for you and that God and the Spirit uh, are saying something to you. May you guys have a great uh, Sabbath day, Sabbath week, and we'll see you again next week. All right. God bless.